Hi, this is Grade 11 CAT, Module 2.1, Local Area Networks. There are many different types of networks. They're classified according to the area that they cover. There's a PAN, which is a personal area network. It's organized around an individual. A HAN is a home area network, and it's obviously it's in a home environment. A LAN is a local area network, covers a small area, generally in one building. The internet is a worldwide computer network, and an intranet is an organization's private network that consists of web pages, usually, and they are usually used only for the group. So the basic components on a network look as follows. We've got a server, then we've got our computers, that connect to the network. We may have, we will have in network interface cards on each computer. We may have useful devices like a printer connected. And then we have a switch, which allows all the computers to be connected. And a very important part is all these cables, which connect the computers to the switch. These are the basic components of a network that we're going to talk about. We get the hardware. Then we have the communication media. And then the network operating system software. And we're going to talk about all of these in more details in the slides that follow. Computers are the hardware. So there are workstations. These are all the computers connected to the network. We talk about clients, and they are the devices that can interact on the network. So these would be your desktops, your laptop, iPads, smartphones, and so on. And we differentiate those from the server, which is the big important computer on the network. So a server is really a powerful computer with more memory and a bigger hard drive than your normal little workstation and they only provide network resources. Nobody's gonna sit at this computer and work at it as if it was their personal workstation. So what they do, they manage the data on the hard drive, they manage network traffic, they control access to services. We'll talk about the services in the special servers below. And they also provide the users with access to their files. So you get special servers. You get servers that are just dedicated to um, serving files and allowing people to access files or to store files on them. You get email, email servers which manage all the emailing going on in a company. You get an internet or a proxy server which controls the access to the internet. And then you get a print server which manages all the printing. Every computer is going to need a network interface card. We call it a NIC for short. It can be on board, built onto the motherboard, or you could have a separate one like the one shown here. And that one would plug into one of the PCI ports on the motherboard, or it could plug into the USB. It allows communication over the network, and a NIC can be wired or wireless. We will also need a switch to create our network. A switch connects devices on a computer network. So here on the right, top right, is a picture of a switch. And you can see that the network cables are all going to plug in there. Large networks have many switches. And switches are usually stored in cabinets, such as the one shown on the bottom left. So how do you know that you are connected to a network if you've got your computer and you're looking at the screen? Well, there are clues. You may see extra logical drives like the U drive, the V drive, the T drive, etc. instead of just the usual C and D drive. You may also see the other computers in the network shown on your screen. You also may have access to devices that you don't that are not plugged into your computer, for example, a printer. 
and there may be a little indicator showing network activity in your notification area. That's bottom right on your screen. The different kinds of cables we use is either UTP or fiber. So UTP, it can only use to about 100 meters because it loses the signal drops after this. It can be eavesdropped. So if you can build a special little device and listen to what's going on in the cable. It is also affected by electrical sources. So if you've got heavy machinery, it could interfere with the signals. And UTP uses electrical signals to transmit data. The um, fiber cable can go much longer distances without losing the, um, the signal. It is immune to eavesdropping. You can't look at what's going on in the, in the cable. It is not affected by electrical sources. And the reason is it uses light. There's light traveling inside the signal, inside the cables, instead of electrical signals. And it's much faster. So we call UTP a wired media. It stands for unshielded twisted pair. And the advantages of UTP is that it's cheap and easy to install. The disadvantages is that you get attenuation, which means the signal decreases. After 100 meters, there's no signal left. It is also susceptible to electromagnetic interference and eavesdropping. The other wired media fiber, it consists of fine glass tubes. It's expensive, far more difficult to install, but it has low attenuation. The signal does not drop after long distances. And it has a larger bandwidth. The signal travels much faster. It's mainly used as a backbone. These days, most of your homes have fiber going to your, to your house. Now, data transmission speed is important in a LAN. And we talk about the rate at which data is transferred over the media used. We could say it's 100 megabits per second or 1,000 megabits per second. The maximum speed depends on your cabling and your devices. For example, the switches and the NICs. And if you look at the specification on a network card, you'll usually see 802.11. And it tells you how fast the signal can travel with your wireless adapter. Now, remember that a wireless LAN will always be slower than a cabled LAN. So if you want really fast internet, rather plug a cable into your laptop or your computer into your router. Now, network software is the last component we need to talk about in a LAN. And you need special software that's going to allow the network to operate. So it's special software, it controls the communication and the security in your network. Now, most operating systems do have built-in networking capabilities. For example, Windows allows you to connect about 10 computers to each other. But if you're going to get bigger than that, you'll need a special network operating system. And they're called the server editions. Now, the advantages of a LAN and a wireless LAN, what are they? So you can store files on the central computer and all the users can access them. You can transfer files without using a flash drive or another device. You can share software between all the users. You can share hardware, for example, a printer. And you can control the security. You can use one internet connection and share it with all your users in the LAN. And it's easier to keep the software up to date because you do it from one central place. And the software can be demonstrated or broadcast to the other computers. You can also monitor what goes on on the internet 
with an, an internet server. You can control that your users don't abuse the internet. The disadvantages of a LAN. It can be expensive to install and maintain. You will need a network administrator to manage it. You have to maintain network security. And if the file server is faulty, no one can access the file and the work stops. Now, in a wireless LAN, there are more disadvantages. The security can be compromised because you can tap into what's going on on the network through the Wi-Fi. And if you have too many people coming connected, performance can decrease. And if you have electrical interference, you can get signal loss and then the Wi-Fi does not operate. So a wireless LAN's advantages compared to a LAN, it's much easier to install. You just walk in, you connect to the, to the Wi-Fi and off you go. It's also easier and more practical if you're going between buildings. It's easy to add and or to move computers. You can move around. If you've got a laptop, you don't need to constantly plug it in and move the cables around. And you don't have the clutter of the cables. Now, we need rules to ensure that a network is secure. So every company has to do the following things. They have to make sure that all their confidential files have restricted access. You can't just let everybody look at them. In a school, it's important that tests are kept safe. You don't want the learners to access the tests if they're stored on a server. So usually everybody has to have a username and a password so that we know who they are and then they can gain access to the network resources. And remember, if you're using a network, choose a password that you don't tell anybody and keep it secret. So just a few tips about choosing and managing passwords. It should be at least eight characters long. Mix uppercase and lowercase letters. Use numbers and special characters. Don't use anything that's easy to guess. Don't use passwords that follow a pattern on the keyboard. Change your password every two months or so. And don't use the same password for more than one site. Here is an example of a good password. It's got uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and a special character. Now, how do we ensure that networks are used ethically? Every company must have an AUP, which stands for Acceptable Use Policy, and it will outline what the rights and the responsibilities of all the users are. So it lists what the users may or may not do on the network. It's designed to protect both the user and the business or the organization or school when people are using ICT facilities. Now on your AUP, what should there be is basic netiquette rules, restrictions on what may be accessed online, restrictions on the amount of data people can download, the importance of responsible ethical, legal and safe practices, the details on where and when portable storage devices may be used. The problem is people use flash drives and they may download confidential information from the company onto them and then take them away. And that causes problems. Restrictions on installing hardware and software, Procedures for victims of identity theft, malware, cyberbullying, and cyberstalking, and the consequences of violating the con conditions set out on the AUP. Remember to go over the summary for your own revision and to do the written module activity in the book.